second plenary session. So after the coffee and also the tea, I think we already have a renewable energy to follow the next session. Because the next session will also in line with the renewable energy. So distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, the need to shift to clean energy is paramount. An equitable transition to clean energy or renewable energy requires more than efforts, but also strong commitments and also a really good uh, policy as we want to make sure that the transition will be delivered in inclusive and also a just energy transition. And thus, the second session, we will have the theme that smoothing green and just energy transition. Ladies and gentlemen, in this session, we will be hearing the keynote address from Mr. Ashok Lavasa, Vice President for Private Sector Operation and Public-Private Partnership of the Asian Development Bank, and also a special address from the Chair of Energy Transition Working Group that will be delivered by Mr. Yudo Dwinanda Priya Adi. And also we have five panelists, and they are Anna Katrina Hornich, Director of the German Development Institute, Frank Jotzo, Director of the Center for Climate Economics and Policy at Australian National University, Nishan Badwaj, Global Green Growth Institute, and Dipali Khanna. And this session will be, of course, led by our Chair, Director of the Center for Global Sustainability at the University of Maryland. So he is the founder and also director for the Center for Global Sustainability at the University of Maryland and professor in the School of Public Policy. His work focuses on the developing, setting and achieving ambitious national climate goals. This include the U.S. emissions mitigation policy, rapid coal phase-out strategies in diverse national contexts, and also the economy-wide emission strategies in the G20 countries, with a focus on China, Indonesia, India, and also many other countries. He was recently the Senior Advisor for the Special Presidential Envoy for Climate at the U.S. Department of State, in which he has involved in many projects, like the negotiations of the U.S.-China Joint Glass Globe Declarations at COP26, and then also the U.S. Uh, long-term strategy and also the U.S. national climate strategies and emissions targets in advance of the announcement of the U.S. 2030 climate target. In the Obama White House, he has helped develop the 2025 U.S. NDC and participated in the Paris climate negotiations. So he is the man, of course, behind of the many uh, important things in uh, re reducing the uh, glass emission, the uh, greenhouse emission. So now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome on the stage the chair for this session. This is Professor Nathan Holtman. Well, thank you for that introduction. It is my pleasure to chair our next session, Smoothing the Green and Just Energy Transition. Energy is a crucial part of development, yet conventional energy we have found has significant limitations as a rap and a rapid, just, and affordable energy transition is urgently needed as it is pivotal to ensure long-term energy sustainability, to reach national economic development and health goals, and to help support reaching global climate goals. However, the energy transition cannot be done by a single country alone. And moreover, global cooperation can greatly enhance the effectiveness and impact of the transition and enhance benefits for each country. Financing, government and institutional support, as well as thoughtful integration of new research and analysis will be required for a smooth transition. This transition, when well done, will serve to enhance quality of life and economic vitality for our people around the world. This is where the G20 plays a pivotal role to ensure uh, a smooth and rapid green and just energy transition and is the topic of this morning's discussion. Today's session will feature a keynote speech, a special address, and a panel discussion with a group of distinguished experts. 
At this point, I would like to invite all of our panelists to please join me on the stage. As they're joining, I'll uh, introduce uh, the speaker for our keynote speech, uh, which will be delivered by Mr. Ashok Lavasa, the Vice President for Private Sector Operations and Public-Private Partnerships of the Asian Development Bank. Mr. Lavasa was previously election commissioner in India, a constitutional position appointed by the President of India, and has also served for nearly four decades with various government agencies in India, including as Union Finance Secretary, Secretary of Environment and Climate Change, and Secretary of Civil Aviation. He also served as additional secretary and special secretary for power. We are fortunate to have Mr. Lavasa to share his views on smoothing the green and just energy transition. Vice President Lavasa, the floor is yours. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Asian Development Bank, it is my honor to speak to you about how to facilitate a green and just energy transition in Asia and the Pacific. I have a slideshow presentation, and uh, I'll request the first slide to be put on, please. As we uh, all recognize, climate change is the biggest threat to human health and the global economy. It can push millions into poverty, endanger lives, and disrupt our drive towards sustainable development. Combined with the continuing pandemic period, climate change particularly hurts the poor and the vulnerable, women and girls, and small island nations. The recent global energy crisis only made matters worse. Our region is highly susceptible to climate change. In 2020 and 21, nearly 40% of the disasters worldwide occurred in Asia and the Pacific. Within the region, most happened in East, Southeast, and South Asia. Despite its small landmass, the Pacific experiences over 5% of the disaster. Millions of people are displaced every year. Climate change damages both economies and finance. For example, a 2020 McKinsey report estimates that by 2050, our region may lose about $1.2 trillion each year in capital stock due to flooding alone and Asia may lose, on average, between $2.8 trillion and $4.7 trillion in gross domestic product annually by 2050, as people are unable to work outdoors for long hours because of increased heat and humidity. A report by the Swiss Institute, the right chart on the slide, shows that economic losses could rise to about 18% of GDP by 2050 in the worst case scenario of a 3.2 degrees Celsius increase. In other words, if no action is taken to mitigate climate change effects. Next slide, please. Asia and the Pacific is at the front lines of climate change. Today, the region is the largest contributor to global annual CO2 emissions, mainly from the burning of fossil fuels. The region generates more than half of global annual carbon emissions. By comparison, the European and North and Central American regions contribute about 15%, 16%, sorry. Asia continues to industrialize. And with overall population growth, it is likely the region's share of global annual CO2 emissions will only increase if we don't act now. One major reason for the large share of global CO2 emissions is the region's continued heavy dependence on coal for electricity and heating. 
the average share of coal power and electricity generation in Asia and the Pacific rose from 40% in 1990 to over 50% by 2020. This was when the world's average share of coal in electricity generation remained about 40% per over the last 30 years. In the European Union, it fell from 40% in 1990 to 17% in 2020. Next slide, please. Now, to reduce the region's contribution to climate change, a first step is to prioritize energy efficiency and renewable energy. The share of renewable energy in generating the region's electricity grew from 21.6% in 2015 to 24.3% in 2019. However, the share of renewable energy remains lower than the world average, and the gap increased in 2019. By comparison, the share of renewables in the European Union in 2019 was around 34%. It is important that G20 members support Asia and the Pacific's green energy transition by finding ways to boost financing and narrow the technology gap, especially in view of the development needs of the region and in accordance with the principles of common but differentiated responsibilities. To this point, let me mention two findings from the International Energy Agency. First, to achieve net zero, we will need to double our capital investments. As shown in the slide on the right, more than half of this investment over the next 30 years will be on electrification of the energy system, including the expansion and upgrade of clean and efficient electricity generation, transmission, and distribution systems. Second, the majority of CO2 emission reductions by 2030 will come from technologies available today. Yet, by 2050, nearly half the reductions will come from technologies that are currently being demonstrated or prototyped. This highlights the importance of research and development, which is central to our discussions at today's T20 Summit. Next slide, please. Another critical aspect of the energy transition is that we must ensure that it's a just transition. This requires all of us to apply the same level of commitment to ensure the energy transition is just, inclusive, and sustainable. Countries can all achieve their long-term national and climate goals while ensuring that no one is left behind and the rights of vulnerable populations and future generations are protected. The IEA estimates that the green energy transition will generate a net gain in new jobs in the clean energy and mining sectors. But it is important to remember that while these new jobs will outpace losses in fuel, fossil fuel sectors, we must address these jobs the job losses as countries transition from coal, oil, and gas. Workers, communities, and women must be protected from the negative impacts of the energy transition, for example, through social protection measures. More than half the new jobs in the clean energy sector are highly skilled, with over a quarter medium skilled. Countries must work to ensure that people possess the right education and skills for future green jobs. Next slide, please. Of course, there are some headwinds as countries transition into green energy. First, the COVID-19 pandemic limited the available fiscal space over the last two years. Expansionary fiscal programs to support businesses and households have worsened fiscal positions while virus containment measures slowed economic activity. Many in Asia recorded fiscal deficits during 2019 and 21 period, where averages in percent of GDP terms are even worse 
than during the global financial crisis. Second, Russia's invasion of Ukraine sent shockwaves across the global economy, causing oil and commodity prices to surge. Asia and the Pacific is vulnerable to these price fluctuations as many continue to rely heavily on oil imports. The region must invest in energy efficiency and renewable energy to diversify the supply mix with cheaper and low carbon energy resources. Next slide, please. So what are the key policy priorities? I see four important policy priorities. First, increased financing. Second, greater private sector participation. Third, build capacity and the right kind of knowledge. And fourth, strengthen international cooperation. Let me briefly discuss each of these in the following slides. Next slide, please. ADB is piloting an innovative energy transition mechanism called ETM for short in Southeast Asia to accelerate the move out of coal to clean energy. The ETM is a replicable and scalable market-based mechanism which takes advantage of low-cost capital from various concessional, public, and private sources to incentivize the early retirement or repurposing of coal-fired power plants and at the same time unleash new investments in clean energy, grid, and storage. ADB proposes a mechanism to be a just energy transition, protecting the livelihoods of workers and communities that will be affected by the transition. Concessional funds can mobilize large amounts of private financing, creating a pool of low-cost capital to retire or repurpose coal plants. It can simultaneously unleash new investment plan in clean energy, grid, and energy storage. The current ETM concept has two funding vehicles. One is a carbon reduction facility focused on coal-fired power plants, and another is a clean energy facility, which facilitates investments in clean energy and enabling grid infrastructure. Both facilities will be housed under an ETM fund vehicle, which is critical in scaling up ETM beyond ADB's own financial capabilities. Feasibility studies have been conducted for Indonesia, the Philippines, and Vietnam to develop optimal business models and transaction structures. Once scaled up, ETM has the potential to be the largest carbon reduction model in the world. For example, if we can retire 50% of the coal power plants over the next 10 to 15 years in Indonesia, the Philippines, and Vietnam, we will remove 200 million tons of CO2 emissions per year, which is equivalent to taking 61 million cars off the road. Next slide, please. We must innovate financing to attract private sector investment, particularly in the energy, green energy transition. We are partnering with private sector on two main initiatives. The first is the Temasek, HSBC, and Clifford Co Capital Holdings under the Asset Regeneration Platform to build green infrastructure in Southeast Asia. Regen. It's called Regen, which will focus initially on Indonesia and Vietnam in areas struggling to attract commercial financing. The second is with Bloomberg Family Foundation and the Goldman Sachs Charitable Gift Fund through the Climate Innovation and Development Fund. This will support the clean energy transition in South and Southeast Asia, initially focusing on India and Indonesia. ADB also launched the ASEAN Catalytic Green Finance Facility in April 2019 to accelerate green infrastructure investments in Southeast Asia. It helps governments prepare and finance infrastructure projects, lowering risk and thus making them more attractive for private capital investors. The Green Recovery Program is linked to the ACGF and aims for a green 
climate resilient recovery from the pandemic, catalyzing climate finance from both private and public sources will support at least 20 high impact, low emission sub projects in the region. Next slide, please. We all know that increased finance is necessary, but not sufficient. Countries need to build knowledge and the capacity to support a just energy transition. At ADB, we launched a technical assistance platform called NDC Advance to support countries implement their nationally determined contributions. It provides knowledge as countries translate NDCs into climate investment plans and identify climate projects. It helps countries mobilize finance and it builds the capacity which countries need to develop ways to measure, monitor, and report progress on NDCs. Knowledge and capacity building is also needed to support climate adaptation and build climate resilience, especially among poor and vulnerable communities. Our Community Resilience Financing Partnership Facility helps scale up community investments in climate adaptation. It offers technical assistance and grants to create knowledge and research, support the preparation of large-scale bankable adaptation investments, and build capacity of local governments, communities, and institutions. Next slide, please. And finally, there is need for urgent and collective action on climate change. We must strengthen international cooperation and domestic policies that support both climate mitigation and adaptation measures. There is work globally at the World Trade Organization and regionally at the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation to reduce trade barriers on environmental goods, such as solar panels, wind turbines, along with equipment for environmental monitoring, analysis, and assessment. These goods are crucial to support climate mitigation. We need to reduce or eliminate trade barriers to make these products more affordable and accessible. Carbon pricing is another key element in the overall climate policy. The two most common direct carbon pricing instruments are carbon taxes and emissions trading schemes. Worldwide, 68 carbon taxes and emissions trading schemes are now operating. There is a growing momentum for carbon pricing in Asia and the Pacific, with six initiatives operating nationally. Japan and Singapore use carbon taxes, while Kazakhstan, New Zealand, the Republic of Korea, and the People's Republic of China launched national emissions trading schemes. More recently, India launched a national carbon trading platform. Other countries like Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand, the Philippines, and Pakistan are also introducing carbon pricing instruments. Still, carbon prices in Asia are too low and a fraction of those in the European Union. More work is needed to raise carbon prices and increase carbon taxes in our region. In closing, let me reaffirm Asian Development Bank's commitment to support our developing member countries in transitioning to a greener and more prosperous, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable Asia and Pacific as they continue to pursue their journey of economic growth and implement sustainable development goals. I thank you for your patience, and I look forward to the session and the discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you, Vice President Lavasa, for those uh, excellent reflections and comments, both substantive and thoughtful, uh, giving us, I think, excellent uh, basis for our discussion that we'll be having uh, in a few minutes, and I think reflecting uh, the best of what the T20 tries to do, bringing substantive input into our policymakers' discussions. Um, so just double-checking, we are good for the next section? Yes? No. Okay. <laughs> um, with that, I think what we will do is um, 
uh, turn to our panel, and I will just go sit down for that then. Okay, so um, as we transition to the discussion then, to discuss uh, some of these topics in the broader context of uh, s the topic of today, smoothing the green and just uh, energy transition, uh, we will now turn to our uh, panel conversation. Uh, so for that, I am happy to uh, introduce um, the, the rest of our distinguished panelists. Um, first of all, uh, we'll just uh, go down the line here. Uh, Frank Jotso is a professor of environmental economics and climate change economics uh, at the ANU Australia National University Crawford School of Public Policy, where he directs the Center for Climate and Energy Policy. He is also head of energy with the ANU Institute for Climate, Energy, and Disaster Solutions and director of the ANU Zero Carbon Energy for Asia Pacific Grand Challenge Initiative. Um, immediately to his right, Professor, uh, Professor Dr. Anna Katharina Hornridge is director of the German Institute of Development and Sustainability and professor for global sustainable development at the University of Bonn. In her research, Professor Hornridge focuses on the role of different types of knowledge in and for processes of change, as well as questions of natural resources governance in agricultural and marine contexts. Uh, Nishant Bardwaj is the Global Sector Lead, Renewable Energy, and Deputy Director of the Global Green Growth Institute. In this role, he is leading technical advisory, strategy, planning, and implementation of renewable energy programs. Nishant will oversee the development and execution of GGGI's renewable energy engagements at country, regional, and global levels. And then on the far end uh, is the Vice President of uh, Asia Region Office, Deepali Khanna, manages uh, the Rockefeller Foundation's policy, advocacy, grant making, and partnerships in Asia. She leads Rockefeller Foundation's initiatives to convene and catalyze strategic collaborations that advance development in Asia, as well as harness Asia's role in enhancing the well-being of humanity in the region and around the world. Uh, more information uh, on our many distinguished speakers is available in the online materials, uh, and I refer you to that. Um, Mr. Lavasa will also be participating in the discussion, and thank you to all of the panelists for joining us. So with that, um, I will go ahead and uh, kick off our conversation. Um, so what we'll do is first go to Professor Jotso, and I'd like to turn to you first. We've heard a bit already today in the previous panel and, and this morning about not only the importance of reaching uh, ambitious development and green economy goals, but also the realization that economies around the world are working towards a green economy with a different degree of scale and speed, and in almost every case, not quickly enough. The degree of openness in trade and investment frameworks can also affect affordability and energy security, and therefore the pace and effectiveness of the transition. Accelerating a just and green energy transition will have some commonalities as well as some differences in developing and developed country contexts. With these considerations in mind, how should we view the opportunities and barriers to creating the right kinds of enabling conditions in these different contexts? Yes, I think it's fair to say we're uh, seeing very understandably a strong focus on energy affordability and energy security right now. And at the same time, of course, it is imperative uh, that the longer term, medium term objective um, of decarbonizing energy supply and in fact moving to a net zero economy globally uh, is, uh, must be the key goal. Um, and uh, what, what is necessary for that? Well, we've heard um, many of these elements um, uh, already. Uh, we need sound uh, economic policy domestically and Mr. Lavasa has got uh, into some of the details of what's, uh, what's required for that. Uh, we need free trade, we, we need uh, open investment uh, frameworks, economic uh, isolationism uh, will throw us back, uh, and Dr. Hatip Basri of course reminded of the, uh, us of that in the opening session, and uh, G20, T20 uh, provide an open, a great opportunity for necessary exchange between countries, between governance, be, between civil society and the research sector uh, about the best way forward. Uh, as Professor Drysdale, uh, among others, uh, reminded us. Now, 
Um, the challenges are, of course, immense. There's hurdles, uh, there's risks in getting it wrong, and yet there's every reason to be optimistic uh, that this transition uh, to a low and zero carbon energy system can happen in a way that meets development goals and that meets affordability and energy security objectives. And the main reason really is technology. Um, we've seen tremendous improvements in the cost of renewable energy systems in particular. Uh, solar is now the cheapest form of energy full stop in many parts of the world. Where land availability is a constraint, we're incre increasingly moving on water, floating solar, offshore wind. Battery storage and other forms of energy storage are becoming rapidly uh, more affordable. And of course, in many parts of the world, carbon capture and storage, and in some parts of the world, nuclear energy also have an important role to play. All of this will add up to a zero carbon electricity supply that can allow us to decarbonize industry, transport, the household sector, everything. In order to get there, we need enormous amounts of investment, and therein lies the challenge, facilitating those investments and cushioning the social and regional impacts that will invariably flow from that really massive transition that we're going to see. And so governments have a very important role um, on these aspects, sound taxation regimes, including carbon taxation, including appropriate energy and resource rent taxation. Reform of regulatory systems, support for research and development, support for green banks and other financial instruments that help leverage new forms of finance, finance for new forms um, of energy, and very importantly, policies and measures to help that adjustment, in particular in the regions that depend very heavily uh, on the old energy uh, economy uh, that, that will change. Openness, international openness. Very important, of course, here. Um, if we move to an isolationist system where we just focus uh, on investments within each country, then this will not be cost effective globally. There is an opportunity in a low carbon economy of the future to have trade in renewable energy based fuels, in renewable energy based uh, energy intensive commodities, and we will want to make sure that we harness that trade in hydrogen and in ammonia, for example. Great. Well, thank you. That, that's a, a, an excellent segue. And so I think I'd like to turn next to Professor Hornridge. Hornridge um, as the energy transition takes a bigger spotlight in fighting climate change, global cooperation is needed now more than ever. Uh, we've heard about this even in the first session and the introduction of today's uh, events. Mobilizing sufficient levels of finance, however, is proven to be uh, an area both of increasing urgency um, at, and a global focus. Uh, but also, with that focus, it's clear that we're still far from the necessary levels that we need to be. At the same time, war in Ukraine, other trends globally toward block building, and disagreements about even democracy versus autocracy and international relations are creating risks to the kinds of cooperation that are needed at this moment. As countries are preparing for COP27, what do you see as the challenges that might arise in ensuring green and just energy transitions, and how might we address those challenges successfully? And I'd like to remind the speakers to hold your mic up to your mouth, which I forgot to do in my earlier comment. Yeah, thank you, uh, Nathan, for this um, important question. And uh, thank you, first of all, I would like to really express my thanks to, to Indonesia, to um, the Indonesian presidency, um, and everyone involved in organizing, hosting us here today. Um, it's, it's much appreciated that you bring us together and to see this leadership unfold, how you fill it. Um, the new Bandung moment has been um, mentioned a few times that I think is quite a steep ask you know, in comparison or with reference to the Bandung conference in 1955. But um, I would agree with, with Peter uh, Dristel, um, who has been celebrating um, and mentioning several times how, how well Indonesia is positioned in, in, in um, filling this difficult role at the moment um, in, in 2022 um, to take care of the G20. So thank you very much. Um, You've mentioned the, or the Russia's war in Ukraine has been mentioned several times, and of course it has to be seen as part of, of a number of bigger processes that have been ongoing since many years. Um, weakened multilateralism, 
um, uh, rising um, forms of polarization, polarization within societies across the globe on all continents um, that, that play out here. And um, it's clear that energy and energy security, and you've just mentioned it, um, is, is right at the center of these discussions and um, plays an important role in negotiating um, a political stability and, um, and symmetry, uh, global symmetry. And at the same time, I think it's also important uh, to remind us of, um, of the fact that the vote that we all witnessed on the 2nd of March uh, this year on the level of the General Assembly of the United Nations with regard to the resolution um, regarding uh, the war in Ukraine um, would have looked very different if we had mixed um, mixed uh, topics and discussions of um, democracies versus autocracies, for instance, so political regime discussions with uh, the reflections on international law, sovereignty, um, and the respect for, for, um, for territory. And what I'm trying to say with this is, I think it's, while energy security is, of course, relevant to geopolitics, it's um, out of a climate perspective very important to not geopoliticize it too much, yeah, but rather to um, step away and, and agree on the fact that climate change is, as a global challenge, so important that we need to come together fighting it irrespective of our different um, political perspectives and, and regimes. Um, that's my first point. My second point is, um, regarding the, the financial question. Of course, the 100 and billion uh, climate financing that has not been met yet and um, is repeatedly not being met is, um, is, an, is a substantial issue and it's no question um, that it has to be uh, met in, in, the coming, in the coming years, in the coming two years as soon as possible. It's a question of credibility actually by now. And at the same time, we also know um, we are facing much bigger sums. Um, the, the costs calculated um, that, or the loss calculated for developing econ countries um, annually caused by the effects of climate change amounts um, up to 300 billion USD, as said, annually. So, um, we, we know the mobilization, and you mentioned it already in your presentation, the mobilization of private capital is um, absolutely crucial. And for Sharm el Sheikh, of course, it is important to, to here also draw on, for instance, the, the um, report of IPCC, the work, Working Group 2 of the IPCC, underlining um, the element of climate justice as a, as a core point for the discussions in Sharm el Sheikh and um, move forward on, on the questions of loss and damage here with this then also placing really an, an emphasis on adaptation and mitigation, um, moving, so to say, the adaptation um, question into, into the focus uh, next to mitigation. Thanks. Well, thank you for both of those points, and um, very much uh, uh, well well taken on the uh, idea of moving ahead as as much as we can collaboratively uh, to 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 see what we can do. Despite some of the differences that the countries uh, have uh, together or right now, we can certainly agree on advancing. I hope some of these uh, some of these aspects uh, in the climate and energy space uh, beyond that. Let's turn, uh, Mr. Bardwaj, uh, transitioning away from uh, fossil fuels um, could, if done carelessly uh, and if done perhaps uh, 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 recklessly, result in higher prices. Uh, we've heard a little bit about that already, rising costs, other types of economic uncertainties, uh, potentially even uh, stranded assets, uh, different kinds of shifts in jobs and the job in the, in the labor force. Uh, and concerns, at least, about energy security. All of these can affect uh, economic stability, and they can also, in turn, affect politics, uh, all of which is a critical part of sustainability and the longevity of sustainability. Can you comment on, uh, and maybe even give examples from some of the work you've been doing, of how you see these forces affecting uh, overall economic stability, 
And as part of that, how might G20 processes like this one uh, help minimize impact and, ma and maximize benefits? Thank you. So good morning, uh, all the panelists and the participants. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, let me start by saying that three-fourths of the energy supplies and about 81% of greenhouse gas emissions comes from G20 countries. Therefore, the battle of climate change will be won or lost in G20 countries. And just energy transition is going to play a very critical role when we talk about climate goals. 70% of the primary energy demand in G20 countries, and which include the emerging economies, comes from fossil fuels. Because the resources for the emerging economies and the developing economies is quite limited, uh, to achieve the energy transition of that scale is going to be a very Herculean task. Not to say that this cannot be achieved, but this can be achieved, but we need the right strategies to do that. The other challenge with developing countries is decarbonize while developing. And the need is now. And it is not in the future. Countries need support now to meet their 2030 goals and in the immediate terms. The concerns of job losses, and the cost of stranded assets. These are the real concerns. But again, the important issue is the big elephant in the room is energy security and the cost and the affordability of the green infrastructure and its services. But having said that, the green transition or the energy transition can be achieved if the G20 countries decide to get away with the fossil fuel subsidies. According to one estimate, about $100 trillion would be required for a complete energy transition between now and 2050. And the G20 countries provided $587 billion worth of fossil fuel subsidies every year from 2017 to 2019. So large part of this energy transition can be paid by getting away or phasing out energy subsidies. Uh, but also, I would like to say that the geopolitical situation is also forcing some of the developing countries to think about uh, the uh, energy transition towards renewable energy uh, and reduce their dependence on uh, the external uh, fuel supplies, I would say. Therefore, the energy transition is a very powerful mechanism to create some kind of a resilience and uh, reduce the vulnerability of countries towards weaponizing the energy supply. I would like to uh, also say that uh, when it comes to affordability, uh, the countries need to come out with certain strategies to look into the practical measures for uh, providing green infrastructure services in an affordable manner to its consumers and industries. Let me illustrate that with an example. GGGI, as the technical and financial advisor to the government of Madhya Pradesh in India, uh, is helping to develop world's largest floating solar project. Frank just mentioned about floating solar. Those who are wondering what is floating solar, the solar plant that is developed on the water bodies. And normally the solar plants are developed on ground. But that's called as ground-mounted solar. So this project has gone for international bidding process uh, for uh, selecting a project developer based on price of electricity that the utilities will purchase from. The price of electricity that was discovered through this process was double the cost of uh, 
the ground mounted solar that's what we are talking about the issue of cost effectiveness and the affordability ultimately this cost will be passed on to the consumers unless innovative mechanisms like carbon finance or countries decide to get away with their fossil fuels and create certain kind of funds to help an energy transition at a scale so this is just as an example uh, to show that what countries could achieve and how the energy transition could be managed uh, you talked about jobs chair uh, so many countries including some of the g20 countries are already recognizing uh, the need for just transition and they are mainstreaming a very important components of just transition into their recovery plans that includes increasing the pace for green infrastructure development which is the main means of creating the jobs reevaluating their entire supply chains to look at if there are local jobs created through those and also skilling and reskilling of workforce uh, because there would be need for new competencies for energy transition and also making sure that before the financial incentives are provided uh, there is a green consideration all these are very positive developments uh, in in terms of uh, uh, the uh, linking of uh, the financial packages but what what is important for countries to recognize here is that while we make this transition there is a need for a fair and a well structured transition for workers and enterprise enterprises because they are the ones who are going to get affected the most and this can be achieved through a consultation process and social dialogue and i would say that a, a very active labor policies and i think this needs a governance at all levels uh, so just to give you an example of what ggji is doing in terms of uh, some innovative policies that can ease the transition for marginalized colombia is world's largest fifth largest supplier of coal and sector represent about 1% of the national gdp and provides employment for 35000 people and provide royalties of about 700 and 60 million dollar to the local governments as the global demand for the coal is going to do, go down it is expected that the the coal mining concessions will end in next 15 years therefore the colombian livelihoods are at risk and there is an imminent recession for coal producing regions so ggi is supporting the national mining agency to develop a climate neutral and economic transition strategy that includes emission offsets and socio economic transition through land use projects such as commercial forest plantation agroforestry system and productive restoration and conservation of natural forest uh, this strategy uh, will target creation of formal green jobs to benefit communities livelihoods in short medium and long term in colombia coal producing economically vulnerable and dependent on uh, royalties from coal so i'll stop here chair thank you thank you for those comments and there's some uh uh cause for enthusiasm in some of the responses you've been getting to that so that's exciting to see um okay so ms kana let's turn to you um one of the major bottlenecks uh, that we've we've experienced for green investment uh, in developing countries is couple of pieces high risk perceived by investors and also the difficulty of aggregating enough finance uh, together to undertake projects in the right way um so taking perspective of private investors or uh, other perspectives that you've been uh, been uh, aware of in your work what kind of uh, uh approaches are available uh, and needed to be expanded in the future which might include for example de-risking instruments blended finance or other types of things where do you see real opportunities in the most uh, sort of chance for quick innovation Great. Thank you so much and I want to begin by thanking the co-chairs of T20 for inviting us. It's a real privilege and pleasure to be here today. 
Um, before I answer your question, I just want to provide some additional context. Um, 81 energy poor countries contribute 8% of carbon emissions. This, con this um, is going to go up significantly by 2050 to 75% if these countries are not provided financing in the clean energy space. As of now, they're only getting 20% of financing, and even though they are really home to more than 50% of the energy poor people. We also know that 2030, the, decade, the UN um, decade of action, uh, where we're really trying to ensure that access to reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all becomes a reality. However, what we are seeing is a decrease in international flows for renewables. If you just look at the numbers, in 2017, the flows were around for renewable energy at about $20.7 billion. In 2019, that's come down to $10.9 billion. And I think if you look at the numbers in 2022, it'll be further reduced because of the current crisis that we're facing, both as a result of the pandemic as well as the Ukraine crisis. We need to ensure that this energy, so what, what one really wants to say here is that the energy transition that we want to really be pursuing should leave no one behind and make opportunities universal and sustainable for all. To ensure such a just, equitable transition, a massive amount of funding is needed. If you really look at India at this point of time, for India to achieve its uh, 2070 targets, they'll need $10 trillion. South Africa, which is the 14th largest carbon emitter, needs about $1.6 billion annually to each, reach its climate goals by 2030. So there is a stellar opportunity, and I hate to say it's a stellar opportunity for the private sector, but the private sector can really step up to unlock increased funding in energy transition and enable a tomorrow where we can empower and protect the world's poorest and most vulnerable populations. As you rightfully pointed out, of course it's risky. And this is why organizations such as ours, the Rockefeller Foundation, we are really trying to see how we can take risks where others won't and really make a business case for an improved future. Philanthropic capital can support financial product innovation and attract investors with proof of impact of scaling solutions and ultimately de-risk these investments for our colleagues in the world of business and policy. Through our investments, the Rockefeller Foundation is growing, uh, is putting in more resources and trying to really increase demand, so really increase the demand for energy consumption and also building resilient energy systems so we are looking forward to really seeing how we can improve livelihoods, how we can provide better health outcomes, how can we help poorer communities to deal with the climate crisis. At COP26 last year, we launched the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet, which, is, which aims to really unlock $100 billion in public and private financing to reach a billion underserved communities where they have access to reliable energy they, we're also trying to mitigate reduction by 4 billion tons, uh, and we're also trying to see how we can really drive economic growth. Uh, spread across uh, continents of Africa, Asia, Latin America, the Alliance has key players where we have governments, the Italian government, the UK government, as well as Denmark, and we also have multilateral banks as well as DFIs as a part of it, and of course, the ETM work that you mentioned, you know, that's something where the Rockefeller Foundation, through the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet, is also investing, and we're very actively engaged in conversations with the government of Indonesia, which is really taking the lead, and is showing so much of sincerity in really driving the energy transition work, which is really going to be, um, I think, a real uh, best case example for other countries to follow. I know Vietnam and other countries also pursuing the same thing, but Indonesia is definitely way ahead. We've also been able to catalyze resources, besides our resources, from two other foundations. So we have the Bezos Earth Fund, as well as IKEA, that have also put in close to $500 million each. So $1.5 billion is coming from the foundations, and the rest is being leveraged through the MFIs and the DFIs. So to enhance further collaboration and bring more multiple uh, stakeholders into this, Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet is also reaching out to the developing countries to really ensure that they can become part of this by really accessing technology as well as financing. So there has been a call for global 
uh, there's a call for transformational country programs, and we're hoping more and more countries will become part of this platform. And I feel this is what is really needed today. Increased funding and enabling a just and reliable, uh, reliable transition and multilateral collaboration with governments, high net worth individuals, philanthropies, and impact uh, investors is, is really what is the need of the hour. This collaboration itself is a strong de-risking instrument, and we can be stronger and better together. So our team at GAP is also trying to see how we can look at voluntary carbon markets as a potential area for interest to engage the private sector. These markets link net zero commitments from corporations with projects that can reduce carbon emissions. Um, I know this is, of course, it raises a lot of questions because there are questions around accreditation and quality. But at the same time, it does hold a lot of potential. So that's probably an area where all the think tanks that are here can really delve deeper because this could really be exciting for the private sector. Projects, projects could range from those that are focused on really uh, removing emissions from the atmosphere to those focused on deploying renewable energy technologies. So there's a kind of wide spectrum where the private sector can be coming in. The vital role of investment in a net zero future being reflected the world, is being reflected really the world over. India's renewable energy investments is likely to cross $15, million, $15 billion in 2022. And we're seeing that the industry leaders, government, as well as companies that are gradually venturing into the clean energy market. So there's a need for more commercial investment, which can really be accelerated by reducing cost and regulatory barriers and activating carbon markets. So I'll conclude by saying that this shared responsibility and risk taking is the way to redirect capital flows where we need them the most. So I think that really is something where all of us can really put our heads together to really ensure that we have an inclusive development with energy transition being front and center. Thank you for those uh, thoughtful comments and appreciate that uh, call to action for our research organizations to be thinking innovative uh, thoughts about how to combine those, uh, the finance and the ways you've, you've identified. Um, let's now turn uh, for the, uh, this next statement to Mr. Savasa again. And thank you for the keynote speech and thanks you for all the comments there. Um, building off of these other comments we've heard from the panel, um, we've heard that ensuring a green and just energy transition requires a set of components. Uh, it, it includes finance, it includes green technology, it includes access to social safety nets, uh, and uh, an element of green jobs. And we've heard comments from all of the panelists so far about these diverse aspects. Is there any of these that stands out to you as the most important component, or if not, how do you see the linkages between them? Uh, thank you, Nate, for that question. And before I respond to your question, I would like to acknowledge that uh, all the points that have been made by the panelists are excellent. And they brought out uh, many of the concerns and many of the issues that I think uh, the world is grappling with. Uh, and especially uh, when I look back to 2015 when uh, I was uh, participating in the Paris Agreement negotiations as uh, leading the Indian official delegation. I think it's a matter of great satisfaction for uh, everybody, uh, mostly the developing countries, that the focus has now shifted on just transition. So it's not only about dealing with the, the ill effects of climate change and, uh, uh, in a sense, accelerating uh, climate action, but it is also to acknowledge the development needs of the developing countries and see how we can achieve a just transition. So I think that is a matter of great satisfaction and that according to uh, me uh, and according to what the Asian Development Bank believes will uh, help in achieving greater collaboration, greater cooperation in different countries. Uh, having said this, I remember that last year, uh, I think it was October 21, uh, when the multilateral banks met and uh, gave out five uh, principles of uh, assuring uh, or how we work towards just transition by following five principles. And these five principles I am repeating because I feel that it is not enough just to uh, follow one line of action. It would be important perhaps to 
take all these actions together if we have to achieve the results. And I think the foremost of them is that while uh, adopting climate-friendly technologies, uh, taking climate action, we need to acknowledge the socio-economic needs of different countries and work for the development of those countries and ensure that whatever is done is done in a cl climate-friendly way. And in order to do this, the second thing is that we will uh, have to find ways of innovative financing, uh, knowledge sharing, and bringing technologies uh, on board. We've seen this happen in the space of renewable energy, where uh, the, not only the scaling up has taken place, the costs have come down, the acceptability has uh, grown uh, much in the developing countries, and at the same time now there is work going on in finding new uh, technologies for storage, uh, etc. So I think that uh, is the key that we find innovative ways, we share uh, technologies, knowledge, and we provide finance. The third point, I think, which has come out very clearly is that this is a task which governments cannot do by themselves, or no amount of public resources. First of all, there is uh, a competing pressure on public resources. So whatever public resources governments are able to deploy for uh, pursuing climate action will have to not only be supplemented, but enormously uh, added to by the private sector effort. And it is encouraging to find that in the world, uh, many corporates are coming forward, having their own climate-friendly philosophy, their outlook has changed, and the way they do business, I think, is changing. So that's a very encouraging thing. And so private sector uh, contribution is paramount. The third thing is that while this is all going on, and this is what I alluded to in my address, and many panelists have said that we have to take care of those who are affected by this transition. And the fifth is that the planning for the future, in fact, the present, which because the future is here, the planning for the future has to be done by including all stakeholders. Uh, it is not something that people can imagine sitting in uh, ministries. It is not something which people can conceive uh, sitting in corporate houses. It is something in which we have to take all stakeholders along. So to conclude uh, uh, and to respond specifically to what you asked, I think all these five elements have to go together and there is a need for huge international collaboration. Because without all of us coming together, it might not be possible to get where we want to get and do even more. So uh, I, I would always like to state, and I keep repeating this everywhere, that it is not alone, but it is together. It is not tomorrow, but today. And it is also that words have to be followed by deeds. All resolutions uh, made uh, in all conferences, global, national, will have to be supplemented by resources, uh, human, financial, and techn technological. Thank you. Thank you for those comments, which also helpfully uh, synthesize some of the other thoughts that we've been hearing from the other panelists. Um, since we have limited time, I'd like to propose a very quick lightning round of one-minute responses from you all. Um, we're here as part of the T20, which is an important input to the overall G20 process. You all have expertise in aspects of energy transitions, and you each work on understanding, communicating, and implementing strategies that can improve these energy transitions in a way that is more economically beneficial, feasible, and sustainable. In a roughly one-minute comment, what do you see as the most important one or two new areas of knowledge that will be needed from our research communities uh, represented within the T20 as well as beyond to work on over the next, say, one to three years? And how do we think that the T20 process in the future can uh, include these uh, important ideas, and not just for this year's uh, uh, hosting by Indonesia, but also as we sort of think about the transition to the future presidencies? Um, does anybody want to actually volunteer to go first? If not, I'll call on Frank. Okay, Ms. Khanna. Uh, yeah, um, that's a great question. I think, and also, as was said, collaboration is key. So I think what T20 can really do is to really make sure that 
all the stakeholders. I mean, we also heard in the plenary session before, like APEC and G20. I mean, there's just so much of duplication of efforts and how are we kind of harmonizing the action that we want to take to our leaders so that they kind of, we all singing from the same hymn book and then really holding them accountable to results. So I think T20, how can it really harmonize, of course, across all the different uh, groups and, you know, that they're already doing, but I think one can get smarter and more effective. I think the second piece is the business models. There's so many business mo models out mm. there. I mean, whenever you talk to the private sector, they're looking for where can we really find proof of concept that can be scaled and sustainable. So, you know, the think tank group, putting forward, you know, what has worked, the good, the bad, the ugly, so that we are not wasting resources over and over again, investing in research and business models that haven't worked would be important. Also, one has seen, you know, there's a need to reduce costs, there's a need to reduce the regulate, I mean, there's a need to really address regulatory issues. So, you know, how can we look across the G20 countries, their best practices, there's a lot of knowledge out there. How can we have a more vibrant platform where in real time countries can learn from each other and really advance the work as opposed to just reinventing the wheel over and over again. Thank you for that comment. Anybody else want to jump in? Frank. Yeah, well, uh, we need to deeply understand what works and what doesn't and why on energy transition and especially in developing countries, right? And so to say it very clearly, this is a developing country and industrializing country story. This is where the great majority of investments are needed in growing economies, right? Um, and this is where the adjustment, of course, will also most, be most difficult. I live and work in Australia where we think we have a problem because we produce and export some coal, right? Um, look at developing countries where these sectors are really large and a transition uh, effort in, in, involved in that, right? Um, and so best practice, you just mentioned best practice. Um, we can think of uh, institutional strengthening based on the T20 and G20. We could establish something like a best practice forum on energy transition. Okay, uh, this could be something where the T20 comes together with the B20 and the G20 mm. um, as, uh, as a body that has some longevity, some continuity at the working level, right? Tell, take the politics out of it, establish some trust, have the officials, this community, the business community get together. Could be a great legacy mm -hmm. from the Indonesian T20. Uh, yeah. India's T20 could take it up. Brazil and South Korea, uh, South Africa, sorry, uh, could, could really mm -hmm. develop this uh, into something um, that, that has a lasting impact. Please, yeah. And then, best uh, practices, yeah. I know I said that, but you know, um, how can we create a forum where we can fail fast and learn fast? Because if we talk about best, there's so much of learning that comes out from failure. So I think if we can really have, create that forum where it's okay to fail, because there's no ready-made pathway, right? And um, so that's really important. And the second piece is, how do we keep the Global South in the center? How do we get the communities that are most affected front and center? And that's where I think the T20 can also provide that perspective and bring it to the leaders. Brilliant. Yes, Anna Katharina. Yeah, thanks. Um, I fully agree with everything that has been said. Um, also, the topics that have to be put forward and pushed. Um, overall, I would summarize it under sort of the topic that um, science and research and development has to contribute or has to offer the 50% of the technologies and innovations that you mentioned that we need in order to arrive at a CO2 neutral um, wealth creation and generation by 2050. Um, but that means we need to actually also reinvent uh, the science systems that we have into science systems that um, indeed um, drive uh, circular economy developments forward. And that's a complete revamping and rethinking within the scientific knowledge production that we are practicing since sort of 200 years and has, you know, brings in substantial challenges for the further development of our unfortunately largely nationally organized science systems, no? meaning we need regionally organized science systems, we need a multilateral uh, science financing body in order to encourage, um, encourage these processes. And second aspect I just want to take up, I mean, um, together with Dennis Snow and the Global Solutions Initiative, um, and we are currently um, organizing the, the T7 process within the German 
um, G7 presidency. And as part of this witnessing um, how a new government that was elected uh, November last year, or came in November last year, is finding itself in and is challenged by finding its own sort of global leadership um, role. And I just want to, to mention also for, for, for Indonesia, but also for, for then India and the upcoming presidencies, to me that is a very interesting, very important insight, what kind of role a think process plays in supporting um, a government in identifying its leadership style on the global level, on the regional level, within the European context for us, but within the ASEAN context at the moment for Indonesia, and then within the global um, level. And I think it's very important to underline it has to be intellectual leadership, mm. not military focused or economically defined or politically only defined. No, it has to be filled by intellectual leadership. Great concept there, and I, I love the intellectual leadership dimension of this. So um, we really just have about two minutes. So um, Nishant, did you want to pipe in and then yeah, we'll uh, wrap up with Mr. Savasana? Thank Sebastian. you, Chair, for giving me the floor. I just want to make uh, two recommendations here, uh, and the practical, because you talked about research. Uh, I think a lot of investment in the, in the green uh, energy space is not happening because of the risk perception. I think there's a need for developing a risk management instrument or the uh, so I, I would say that the think 20 should work on developing de-risking instruments uh, and doing a research on that what would make the change in the landscape the second very important is how do we phase out fossil fuel subsidies and I think it's it is think 20 that needs to come out with those strategies to phase out uh, the subsidies, if you look at the data, G20, with their respective MDBs, actually provided two and a half times more public finance to the fossil fuel compared to renewable energy in 2019 and 2020. So that's the scale that we are talking about. And we have to come out with some practical strategies and through a task force that is empowered to negotiate with countries to say that what is their timeline to phase out fossil fuel subsidies. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Savasa, can you wrap uh, us up? Thank you. I don't think I can say anything uh, different from what has been said uh, by all the speakers. Uh, but I think there are three elementary things that we must uh, revise and reinforce again and again. One is the development imperative. People want to grow, people want to prosper, people want to develop. So that right to development is fundamental, it has to be recognized. The second is that growth in the past and global cooperation has helped a lot in development. So that element has to be recognized. And the third is that energy has fueled growth at least in the last three, four centuries, it has been very critical in fueling growth. So the energy requirement and the energy security needs of, for development, I think that has to be recognized. And in order to make energy uh, adequate, affordable, and accessible, I think we need to put in as much resource as we can to meet the energy requirements of the world. And finally, I would say that we have to unleash as much intellectual power as we are capable of, or probably more, in order to unite, in order to provide solutions. The energy transition mechanism, for example, given by the Asian Development Bank, is one initiative. I think there are many, many more initiatives that can be taken. And what what we would like to foresee is a collaboration in finding technologies in the world which are easily available to everyone. So I think we are moving in the right direction, but we need to move probably a little faster. Thank you. 
thank you for those comments and um, a great call to action for all of us to think about what we can do uh, better and more quickly to help support our political leaders as they're thinking through all these important issues. So uh, I want to thank the panelists. Uh, please stay up on the, on the stage for a few minutes because we actually are going to uh, we have good news that we have uh, now the ability to uh, welcome virtually um, uh, Mr. Yudo Duenanda Priadi uh, to provide the special address on the outcomes of the Energy Transition Working Group. So we'll transition very briefly to that. Mr. Priadi is on the expert staff of the Minister of Energy and Mineral Resources for Strategic Planning as chair of the Energy Transitions Working Group. Uh, he has a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from Bandung Institute of Technology and a master's degree from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So with that, uh, we will wrap up our session today by hearing the inputs uh, from uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Priyadi, and then after that's done, we'll wrap up the session. Honorable Professor Chismas Majuta and Professor Bambang Brojongoro, lead concept of the 20 Indonesia, Mr. Asok Lafasa, VP of Private Sector Operation and Public Private Partnership, ADB, all the two speakers in this session and not mentioned by person, these two participants, greetings to you all, good morning from Jakarta. My name is Yudo Priyadi, I am the chair of G20 and again transition working group ETWG. I am pleased to deliver the special address of the second plenary session of the T20 summit. I am delighted that this plenary session and the summit share strong correlation each other. This plenary session has been on smoothing green and just and energy transition, while the T20 summit addresses the main theme of strengthening the role of G20 to navigate the current global dynamics. Combining them both two main themes, I would like to address to you all that is the G20 leadership roles to navigate the current global dynamics through energy transition that just, equitable, affordable, green and sustainable. G20 leadership role prefers for two decades as the most premier economic forum as well as the club of major producer and consumer of energy. G20 comprises a series of significant economic and energy dominance, 80% of global industrial output while covering 80% as well of global GDP, 75% of international trade, 81% of carbon emission in energy sectors and 77% of global energy consumption. These facts are highly influential to signal the global markets and guide international communities towards global agenda in energy and economy. As many of you have known, energy transition has become one of three main pillars of G20 Indonesian presidency. These are three pillars that the presidency considers relevant to our current global challenges global health architecture, digital economic transformation, and sustainable energy transition. These pillars are expected to actualize the presidency mandate, recover together, recover stronger, which international communities are currently dealing with. The energy transition pillars aim to strengthen and accelerate a just energy transition. The Forum of Energy Transition set three main priorities on access, technology, and finance. They are the first, securing energy accessibility, second, scaling up smart and clean energy technologies, and third, advancing energy financing. I am proud to share with all of you that G20 ETWG meetings has, has been just recently concluded by Energy Transition Minister Meeting, ETMM. We have done the meetings of ETWG3 on 31st August to 1st September and ETMM on 2nd September in Nusa Dua, Bali. After lengthy and tireless negotiation and session, G20, ETMM, and ETWG third has, has finally agreed the consensus document of Bali Compact. Briefly speaking, briefly speaking, Bali Compact consists of nine principles with its support part. Bali Compact represents and compass a policy foundation to underpin G20 action to accelerate energy transitions which are clean, sustainable, just, affordable, and inclusive. Bali Compact will send clear signal to the international community how about G20 as the global economic powerhouse should deliver this critical decade of action 
for achieving the goals of Agenda 2030 on Sustainable Development and Paris Agreement, as well as highlighting practical action to achieve long-term goals of net zero emission or carbon neutrality commitments. We do hope that Bali Compact could be brought forward of the G20 Summit in Bali. Here is the summary of the main points of the nine principles. Strengthening confidence and clarity in international planning, in implementation and review, enhancing energy security, market stability and affordability, third, securing resilient, sustainable and durable energy supply infrastructure and system for boosting energy efficiency measure, fifth, diversifying energy system and mixes, as well as lowering emission from all energy sources, catalyzing sustainable inclusive investment at scale, collaborating on mobilizing all sources of finance, eight, scaling up innovative, affordable, smart, low and net zero emission technologies, and Last one, building and strengthening innovation ecosystem that boosts research, development, demonstration, dissemination, and deployment. The presidency's year of 2022 become a never easy year for all economies. Our key developers in the transition pillar aim to address several concerns with the spirit within the spirit of presidency of Recover Together, Recover Struggle which are truly important to be elaborated by T20 Forum. First, more resilient global energy system are needed to address the urgency to rapidly transform global energy architecture. This need to become more secure, reliable, and resilient, as well as advancing energy security to accelerate and ensure clean, sustainable, just, affordable, and inclusive energy transition. In fact, at national level, countries have their respective challenges and need in transitioning their energy system to become more sustainable. The existing energy structure and system from infrastructure to established organization system should be continuously transformed and adjusted to, re to respond to global challenges and support energy transition. Second, Strengthening efforts to achieve global goals are needed to reaffirm our commitment to achieve target of SDGs, Paris Agreement, and Glass Global Climate Pact. Challenges remain and getting more complex. After the pandemic year, there are around 2.4 billion people without clean cooking access and around 730 million people without electricity access. Meanwhile, beyond those basic universal energy, access. We need to eradicate energy poverty and attain modern energy minimum requirement for a thousand kilowatt hour per capita per annum to achieve energy equity both in developed and developing countries. The technology availability should be increased to more than 50 percent to support energy transition with innovative technologies while increasing more robust clean energy investment in energy market and the economies. Innovative sustainable financing need to mobilize for tapping opportunity from the fulfillment of US, US $100 billion climate financing as well as multiplying annual investment to scale up the share of clean energy sources. Third, international cooperation must become the key factor to enable partnership toward just, affordable, reliable, and sustainable energy transition. We need to strengthen collaboration for innovative partnership and ensure both financing and access to the necessary technologies. Countries with less capacity and heavier burdens in the clean energy transition should be technologically, technologically and financially supported. In the transition, there are also opportunities to transform towards green and inclusive economy. If just energy transition is to be achieved, new opportunities such as jobs and other prospects will be essential to support global economic recovery. While having no option but to accelerate for the global energy transition, no single stakeholder will cope with this transformational status alone. This presidency year is an opportunity to attract more green investment and engage with stakeholders, international partners, and global forums. 
all in all, I want to address my highest appreciation to T20 for addressing an again transition as one session in the summit. As the strategic thinker forum for G20 members, I hope T20 can continue to amplify an again transition pillar within the framework of just an again transition. This amplification, this amplification indeed will represent the multi-level significance of just transition in the global stage as well as Indonesia's and developing countries' perspective on achieving Agenda 2030 of SDGs and also nature emission or carbon neutrality commitment. Indonesia has begun the first of four consecutive G20 presidencies for emerging markets and developing economies. Our presidency will be followed by India 2030, Brazil 2024, sorry, India 2023, Brazil 2024, and South Africa 2025. Clean and just energy transition will become the global solution towards the current and future challenges for achieving sustainability. In this regard, I do believe that T20 will advance the issue and pathways to achieve just and orderly energy transition as well as enhance the G20 role in navigating global dynamics. Without further ado, for T20, I wish you all have a successful summit. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you to Mr. Priyadi for those uh, excellent comments and readout of uh, the, the many discussions that have been had to get us to this point. Um, and uh, with that, I'd like to uh, wrap up our session. Uh, I want to thank the panelists. We've had a wonderful conversation uh, with a, a, a kickoff keynote with a lot of uh, a good sort of fodder for us to talk through. Uh, we've talked about the challenges that we face as a global community, talking about the opportunities to work together toward uh, thinking about accessibility, uh, mobilizing finance, and delivering it in a just and equitable way uh, for the energy transition. So with that, um, thank, let us thank the panelists, and we will uh, break for the next phase, which I believe is lunch. <laughs> Go to the MCs. Thank you so much to our chair on the second plenary session so much. So, Mr. Hutchman, once again, thank you. And to all of the panelists, we would like to kindly invite you for a further session here before we close the uh, first morning session of the T20 Indonesia Summit 2022. Please have a further session once again. Well, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, of course, we're going to start later on the special session and also the parallel sessions once we finish the lunch break session. So uh, please don't forget to also join us for the special session as well as the parallel session. And please be reminded with your schedules. And for those who haven't registered yourself, once again, we would like to kindly remind you to register yourself at the registration counter for the special session as well as the parallel session. And once again now, please give a round of applause to all of the panelists and also the chair of the second plenary session. All right, thank you ladies and gentlemen, you may be seated. Thank you so much. And now, once again, we are entering the lunch time and lunch, we will serve the lunch at the Grain Restaurant. Time given is 75 minutes. Please do get back to the ballroom, ladies and gentlemen, for the next agenda, which is the special session and parallel session, okay? Yes. Correct. So the special session will take the theme of the launch of the G20 Research Forum and it will be happening here at the same place. And for the parallel session, once again, you can just get the details of the schedules on the uh, uh, websites, of course, right? Yes, of course. We, have, we have several rooms mm -hmm. for the parallel session one. Room Sawangan one with the theme building the future of global food system opportunities and challenges. Room Sawangan 2 with the theme green and digital technology adoption in the context of global value chains. Room Sawangan 3 yes. with the theme leveraging digital transformation and smartization to improve quality of life. Room Paruman 4 to 6 with the theme healthcare innovative financing for a sustainable and equitable access to new cancer treatments. Yes, so once again, please be reminded with all of the details of the schedules and also the parallel sessions. And then after 90 minutes meetings for each special session and also the parallel session one, we will continue for 15 minutes of coffee break. And then we're going to continue with the next agenda. That is the parallel session two. So for the next parallel session two, it will be happening at the room Sawangan one for the theme of driving digitalization to close trade and supply chain finance gap. 
Room Sawangan 2 on the theme of fostering collective action and tangible cooperation in climate-related investment. Room Sawangan 3 on the theme of the future of digital trade policy. Room Parman 4 to 6 on the theme of beyond GDP and towards inclusive wealth implications for the SDGs financing and other long-term decision-making. And Room Sawangan 6 for the book launch on Creative Economy 2030, imagining and delivering a robust, creative, inclusive and sustainable recovery. Yes, so ladies and gentlemen, enjoy your meeting. We will see you again at the gala dinner here at Paruman Ballroom at 7 p.m. Bali time. Yes, once again, enjoy your lunch. Selamat makan siang. Thank you and enjoy the fruitful discussion during the special sessions and also the parallel sessions. See you tonight. May we have your attention please, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. We update the uh, time, the allocated time for lunch break.